Good morning, Oslo Community Church. Uh, hello to everyone downstairs and watching online. Uh, we are so close to Christmas, I feel like I can taste it. I uh, don't have a lot of announcements this morning. One announcement is that our Christmas Eve service is, of course, on Christmas Eve. And it's going to be at 6 o'clock. And just like Sunday mornings, we're going to be here in the sanctuary. We're going to have the fellowship hall open. And it, as long as everything works right, we will be on Facebook as well. So that is Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock this year. Our other announcement is that Awana is on a Christmas break. Uh, until January, so uh, don't try to drop your kids off Wednesday night. We won't be here. Uh, so no Awana until, I believe, don't quote me on this, I believe the first Wednesday of January we will be back. Um, that's all we have for this morning, uh, so if you would bow with me in prayer, uh, we will get started. Father God, we praise you and thank you for being a perfect father to us. We thank you for Christmas time, all the joy that it brings, all the great reminders of your glory, all the great reminders of hope that we have. God, we thank you for uh, what Isaiah calls a sign for us, that a baby was born, called Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you that in a world in which we can so often uh, long for a sign from you, we know that you've already given it to us, that you are with us, that you love us, that you've redeemed us to be with you. God, we thank you for these truths. We thank you for this morning. We ask for your help in seeing you and praising you this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Osco. Let's stand as we lift high the name of Jesus.
keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. You may be seated.
I count them, ten fingers, ten toes, this tiny life entrusted to me. This man-child, no, this God-child, this long-awaited Messiah, this Emmanuel, this God with us. He is beautiful, and I'm sure every mother feels that way about their child. I look into his eyes and one and I look into his eyes and the eyes that will one day look into mine and see my heart. They will also see pure evil, but also pure holy, this child who is pure holy. Every mother wonders what their child will be when they grow up, but I I know. I know who he is and what he will become. I look forward to his first toddler steps, his first words his hot breath on my neck as he goes from an active boy to a sleeping child. His tiny hands bringing me a drooping bouquet of wildflowers. One day, they will clench again in pain, and will I see that too? The words of Isaiah the prophet go through my head as they have been for months now. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment for peace was upon him, his, and by his wounds we are healed. His tiny hands hold on to mine, and I wonder, I wonder if I will have the grace to stand by and let him fulfill his destiny. What have I been called to, oh Father? How can I, and how can you? I'll hold on for this moment just a little bit longer. I'll hold you close, because you are mine to comfort and mine to hold, and one day, I'll call you Lord the Savior, but from now, you're mine, and mine for now.
morning. morning. Everybody up here downstairs online. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, flautists. Earl, next year, it'll be a quartet, right? No? <laughs> Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the blessing and the wonder of the gift that you have given us in Christ. We thank you for this baby that was born in such an ordinary way. And yet, he was no ordinary child. We thank you for your son that you gave us. Not so that he could just live among us and be one of us, but so that he could die for us. So that he could be raised to life. So that our debt could be paid in full. And we could know life eternal. We pray that you would help us this morning. We need to clear away all the other distractions and holiday busyness that comes with this time of year. And that you would help us just even for a little bit to sit and to hear your word. And Lord, I pray that you would help by your Holy Spirit for us to see you and who you are in ways that I cannot communicate, but I know that you can. We pray this all in your name for your glory. Amen. Uh, the famous daredevil and theologian, Evil Knievel, once said, Bones heal, chicks dig scars, pain is temporary, glory is forever. Knievel, of course, is famous for his successful and not as successful motorbike stunts. He captivated the attention and the imagination of millions as he performed breathtaking, death-defying jumps over such things as the ornate fountain outside Caesar's palace or 14 uh, greyhound buses. He lived life on the edge. He pushed things to the limit. He lived full throttle. He reached for things that many thought were impossible, sometimes even at great cost and injury, uh, with countless bones, broken scars, and pain accumulated over the years, all in search of glory. And in some ways, he found it. He still remembered, he still celebrated for all that he did, for all that he achieved and stood for and represents. But in other ways, it's, it's already starting to fade a bit. Uh, if you were to ask a kid in grade school who Evil Knievel is, most probably wouldn't know. But ask him who Duke Kaboom is, character in Toy Story 4 modeled after Knievel. And oh, sure, oh yeah, Duke Kaboom, I know who that is, right? But I bring all this up because I think that quote, and really Evil Knievel himself, epitomize what most people in our culture think about when they hear the word glory. We talk about a blaze of glory, something spectacular and brilliant and breathtaking and awe-inspiring, but usually it's not something that lasts. We go out in a blaze of glory. We don't stick around for a while for a long weekend in a blaze of glory. No, that doesn't happen. Well, we achieve we are amazed, we are entertained, and then we move on to the next thing. In some ways, we live in search of that next glorious moment, that we achieve that next thing, that we climb that next mountain, that we're thrilled or entertained by this or that. Maybe that next episode or movie or YouTube video will give me my next hit of glory, something spectacular and brilliant and breathtaking and awe-inspiring. And in many ways, we bring that idea of glory into the Christmas story, and it seems to fit. As we read, as we read earlier in Luke 2, that an angel of the Lord appeared to shepherds out in the fields, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. And the angel told them the good news of Jesus' birth, and then suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, Peace to men on whom his favor rests. And then the angels left. And that was it. It seems to check all the boxes of our idea of glory, doesn't it? It's a spectacular, brilliant, breathtaking, awe-inspiring event where there's this blaze of glory and then it's gone. But when the Bible talks about 
glory and the glory of God? Is that all that it's talking about? Is it just the great divine Shazam moments of history when God shows up in a blaze of glory? Or is there something more to it? Is the glory of God mainly just all bright lights and brilliant miracles? Or is there something more we need to know and understand about it and about him? This morning, I'd like us to drill down into these questions as we continue our Advent series, uh, Splinters of Great News. We're using this unique uh, nativity set and its different parts and pieces to talk about different parts, different aspects, different splinters of the great news that Jesus has come. We've already used this baby piece to talk about the virgin birth and all that it means and what it matters. We've looked at the cross and more specifically this notch down here to look at the first Christmas announcement back in Genesis 3.15, the promise of the struck heel and the crushed head. Last week we looked at Jesus as the light of the world and we saw the different ways in which the light has pierced, has broken in on the darkness of this world to bring us light and hope and life. This week, we're going to look at this piece to talk about glory. And yes, there is glory in what this piece most readily reminds us of, of that passage in Luke and Jesus' birth of the star and angelic announcements, the great miracle and shazam of it all. There is glory there. I'm not denying that. Not at all. It's right there in the text. But there is something else. There is another glory. I would say even a greater glory that this piece reminds me of. And I hope it will remind you of it as well by the time we're done today. But I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. I'll let you chew on that for a bit. Let you think about what else this piece could remind you of when it comes to glory. I'm not going to tell you even what the main thought for today is either. I want us to dig in and discover it together. So let's get to that. This morning we have five key questions concerning glory. These are in uh, your bulletin or they're up on the screen. The first is, what is glory? Admittedly, aside from sayings like blaze of glory, our modern culture, our context, doesn't really have a lot of familiarity with glory. In many ways, we live in kind of this plastic world where we've celebrated, ooh, celebrity for glory. But that's not the same thing. That's a far cry from awe-inspiring glory and majesty. Glory is really an indispensable biblical word. I mean, if you think, how many hymns and Christmas carols can we not sing if we take out the word glory? It's in a lot of them. We read it in the text of Scripture, talking about God and His glory. So we need to think carefully about what glory actually is and means. And there are a lot of different definitions we can turn to, a lot of different attempts of people to summarize, to put their arms around this idea and concept that is so big and wonderful and awe-inspiring, it's kind of like trying to hug a redwood tree, you know, like whatever angle you take, you're not really going to get the whole thing all in one swoop. But perhaps the best, most fundamental way to think about the glory of God is that it is the Godness of God. Uh, it, it's what makes God, God. Uh, it may be visible in great shazams and moments of glory, but it may also be invisible. But regardless of whether we see it or not, or whether we give him his due for it or not, the glory of God is the sheer weight of who he is. It's the, the reality, the, the infinitely massive majesty of the one true and living God. His splendor, his beauty, his magnificence, the transcendent radiance and greatness of who he is. And we can see the fingerprints of this glory in creation. As we read in Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Or Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, in other words, I would say his glory, have been clearly seen, being understood for what, from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Creation bears his fingerprints. There is, there's glory residue all over what God has made. It, it's meant to point us to, to remind us of, to teach us about who this glorious God is, to point us to the weight of who he is. 
In reference to this idea of seeing the glory of God in creation, Paul David Tripp has known that God has designed the world in which we live to be a glory scope. Uh, it's kind of like a telescope, you know, a telescope. You're aiming at the stars, you can see the stars clearer, you can see them more up close, you can see their glory. And so the earth and all of its creation should focus our eyes on God and magnify his glory, produce wonder in us. As Tripp writes, every beautiful and amazing sight, sound, color, texture, taste, and touch of the created world is a glory, is, has gloriscopic intention built into it. Every powerful and mighty thing, animate and inanimate, is gloriscopic by nature. No created beauty is an end in itself. No physical wonder exists in isolation. Nothing that is, just is. Everything exists for a grand, vertical purpose. The glories of the physical world don't reflect God's glory by happenstance. No. God specifically and carefully designed the physical world to reflect Him. That is to be the glory scope that our poorly seeing eyes so desperately need. As the technician grinds the lens of the telescope for the best clarity and magnification possible, so God fashioned his world in such a way that it would bring his glory into view. God created every fish, stone, flower, bird, cloud, tree, monkey, and leaf to be gloriscopic because our loving creator knows how fundamentally blind we are. And so, yes, we get a glimpse of the sense of the glory of God in creation, the godness of God, his greatness and transcendence and splendor, the massive weight and majestic beauty of who he is. We can see it somewhat in looking at creation. By looking at the wonderful complexity and delicate balance of atoms and DNA, uh, or the breathtaking beauty and vibrant colors found in nature, or the mind-bending diversity of animals and plants and even microorganisms that share this planet with us. And more than just seeing God's glory in creation, we also see it throughout the Bible's story. Those times when the presence of God, the weight of who he is, just invades and takes over the scene. Glory is one of those golden thread words, those golden thread ideas that we can trace through the Bible, and really we can tell the Bible's story through it. Which brings us to our next question, point two. In what ways do we see the glory of God in the Old Testament? You find God's glory in the creation, yes. But you also find it showing up in some of the Bible's greatest, most pivotal moments where God shows up as a visible, active presence. God's glory in those moments is often des described, is often associated with the phenomenon of light and fire. Sometimes uh, of such overwhelming brilliance, unendurable intensity, that it's shrouded in a cloud. Uh, let me give you some examples. We see this at, at the giving of the law in Exodus 24, 15 through 18, where we read, When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh the Lord called to Moses within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain. And he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. We also see this glory in the wilderness wanderings of Israel and in the worship of God in the tabernacle. Exodus 40, 34 through 38. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they would, did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel during all their travels. God's glory, his visible, his active presence with his people, was seen in this cloud that filled the tabernacle, this cloud by day and fire by night that guided them throughout all their wilderness wanderings. Later on, we see the glory of God show up in the same way when the temple was dedicated. First Kings 8, 10, and 11. 
when the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their services because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Sound familiar from the tabernacle? We also see the glory of God in, in calls, in prophetic visions uh, to the prophets in Ezekiel and Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah, as we read in chapter 6, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. This is the vision of God and his godness. Uh, Isaiah was confronted with the weight of who God was, the infinitely massive majesty of God, with all the splendor and magnificence of his greatness and holiness as being set apart and above everything else. Isaiah was so struck by this that he knew he was toast, that he was unworthy in the presence of God. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips that live among a people of unclean lips. And this is the typical response when people are confronted with the glory of God. It is both awe-inspiring and terror-inducing. That's why so often when angels show up, they have to say, fear not, don't be afraid. Because people are terrified. To be confronted with the brilliance and weight of who God is, it knocks people back. It makes people fall to pieces. They fall face down. It's both sacred and dangerous. This glory inspires awe and fear and respect. It at the same time invites us to come closer and says, only so far. Because notice, in all these instances, I read all these for a reason, It's only a partial revelation of God's glory. It's just a a taste of the weight of his glory. People can only get so close. They can only see so much. The, The blinding light, the consuming fire, the cloud, all reveal God's presence, yes, but they also hide it. They also obscure him from being seen. Even in Isaiah's vision, this vision of the glory of God and all his holiness, and yet, did you notice, the vision never gets higher than what, a glimpse at the high and exalted throne he was seating on? The, the, the train of his robe that filled the temple? Words fail to describe the greatness, the weight of the glory of this God. They can rise no higher than the hem of his robe. People see him, or at least they get a sense of his presence, but never fully. Always from a distance, always looking through a glass dimly. And we might begin to wonder at this point, well, is the glory of God just all lights and show? Is it all just miracles and earthquakes and fire and clouds? Is it all just a spectacular, brilliant, breathtaking, awe-inspiring event of God showing up in a blaze of glory and then that's it? Is this like the great and powerful Oz? Where there's impressive lights, a booming voice, pyrotechnics, but then you look behind the curtain and pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Is that what this is? Is that what the glory of God is like? Or is there something more, something of great and infinitely weighty substance behind that curtain? At the center of it, even. The closest we get to answering that question in the Old Testament is found in Exodus 33 and 34. I invite you to turn there with me. It'll be worth it, I promise. I know we flip around a lot sometimes, but we're going to be camping out here a little bit. And there's stuff worth seeing for yourself there. Exodus 33 and 34. Our third question, how does God define his glory? If you want to get to know someone, you can watch them, observe them from a distance. You can talk to other people about them. You can uh, see what they do, listen to what they say, and you can get a pretty good sense of who they are. But nothing beats asking someone directly to tell you about themselves. I know what other people say about you. I know... What I, what I think might be the case, but, but you tell me. You tell me who you are. Not just what you do, not just what you say, but who are you at the core of who you are. And of course, with you or I answering that question, even that can be through a glass dimly as we sometimes have a distorted image of ourselves. We tend to share certain things that make ourselves look a little bit better and not talk about the other things that don't. 
But if someone were to ask God that question when it comes to who he is and how he defines the essence, the center of his godness, his glory, we can trust that his answer will be 100% accurate because he's God and 100% worthy of our attention. And Moses, in Exodus 33 and 34, has the audacity to ask God that question. When, in Exodus 33, verse 18, Moses asked God to show him his glory. Whoa. <laughs> but even more amazing is that God said, okay. What? This God of glory that's always hidden, that's always veiled. But even here... Even in the fullest expression of God's glory in the Old Testament, it's not the full thing. It's just a glimpse. As God told Moses, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. So God told him in verse 21 through 23, Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and put, cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back but my face must not be seen. This would only be a backside glimpse, only a partial revelation of the glory of God. But notice, right after Moses asked God to show him his glory, what does God say? This is so important. How does God respond? Verses 18 and 19, Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause my, all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. Don't miss this. Moses asked to see God's glory. God responds with, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. Friends, we want to define the glory as the great Shazam. We think it, that glory is just a spectacular, brilliant, breathtaking, awe-inspiring power. And yes, it is that. There is that when it comes to the glory of God, to the sheer weight of the godness of God. And yet behind the curtain, when we push past all those bright lights and earthquakes and clouds and fire and smoke, what do we find at the core, at the heart of the glory of God? When Moses asked God to show, to define his own glory, God, tell me, God, show me. What did God say? What did he show Moses? What was at the core, the center of all his glory? Not his greatness. Not a thundering, terrifying voice from the clouds. No, God defines his glory as a matter of his goodness. And then goes on, verse 19, to speak about showing mercy and grace on whomever he wills. And then Moses gets into position, and God, in verse 22, again says, His glory will pass by. And then the Lord passes by and once again defines His glory in terms of goodness. In Exodus 34, 5 through 7. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed His name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. When we speak of God's glory, we are talking about the, the godness of God, the sheer weight of who he is. We are speaking about who God is and what he is like, what makes God, God. And when God tells himself, when he shares what his glory is in this passage, it isn't what we would expect. As Dane Ortland writes in his wonderful book, Gentle and Lowly, our deepest instincts expect him to be thundering, gavel-swinging, judgment-relishing. We expect the bent of God's heart to be retribution to our waywardness. And then Exodus 34 taps us on the shoulder and stops us in our tracks. The bent of God's heart is mercy. His glory is his goodness. His glory is his lowliness. Great is the glory of the Lord, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. Psalm 138. 
We read in Exodus 34 that he is compassionate and gracious. These are the first words to come out of God's mouth after proclaiming his name. The first words that God uses to define who he is, is merciful and gracious. God doesn't reveal his glory as the Lord, the Lord, exacting and precise. It's not the Lord, the Lord, tolerant and overlooking. It's not the Lord, the Lord, disappointed and frustrated. Come on, you guys. No, his highest priority, his deepest delight, his first reaction, his heart, the core of his glory, is merciful and gracious. He he is also, we read, slow to anger. He doesn't have his finger on the trigger. Unlike us who are so easily provoked, so easily triggered, God puts up with a lot. The Old Testament talks at different points about God being provoked to anger. God had to be provoked to anger, but never do we read that he is provoked to love and mercy. That, well, okay, people did enough good stuff and they prayed enough and they all that did Okay, I guess I'll reluctantly show mercy and grace. No, his anger requires a buildup, requires provoking. It takes a lot to get there, but his mercy, his grace is right there on the surface. You prick it and it gushes forth. He is also, we read, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. His heart, his glory is found when we look at the special commitment, the unbreakable covenant bond that God has made with his people, that he has bound himself to. His determined commitment to his people never runs dry. He also maintains love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, or It could be translated maintaining steadfast love to a thousand generations. And that doesn't mean that his goodness, okay, we've hit our limit at a thousand. At one thousand and one, it shuts off. That's not the point. As Dane Ortland again summarizes, it is God's own way of saying there is no termination date on my commitment to you. You can't get rid of my grace to you. You can't outrun my mercy. You can't evade my goodness. My heart is set on you. All this is God saying about himself, about his glory, before ending with, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Which is kind of a downer to hear at first, you know, all this good stuff. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, that. But it reminds us of the reality that the glory of God isn't that he's lenient. It isn't that he's just a big softy. No, he is just. He is righteous. We, we will reap what we sow. Sin and guilt passed down from generation to generation. We see that all around us in the world. But notice the difference. His steadfast, his unbreaking, his forever love flows down to a thousand generations, but he punishes generational sins to the third and fourth generation. Quite a difference there. Yes, our sins will be passed down to our children, our grandchildren, but God's goodness will be passed down way past that, far surpassing that. It swallows up all of our sin in the end. His mercy and grace travel down a thousand generations. And all this is how God defines his own glory. According to his own testimony, this is his deepest heart, his goodness. His glory shines brightest, not in brilliant lights and earthquakes and shazams. His glory shines brightest in his mercy and grace. His deepest heart is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. The godness of God, the infinite weight of who he is, the massive majesty of the one true and living God, his splendor and beauty and magnificence, the transcendent radiance and greatness of who he is is most clearly seen in his goodness, his mercy and grace. But even all this was just a glimpse of the glory of God. It was a passing shadow of his glory. Moses can't see God fully. He can't see his face and live. That would destroy him. It would overwhelm and obliterate him. But what if one day we could see the face and glory of God and live? What if we could see him and it didn't vaporize us on the spot? What if one day we could see the full, unfiltered, awesome glory of God in all of his goodness and grace? Welcome to Christmas. That's what God has done in Jesus for us. Our fourth question and point. How does Jesus fit into this story of the glory of God? 
In Jesus, we find the, the fullest expression of the glory of God. As John writes in John 1, 14, the word, speaking of Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He came down, he tabernacled among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory. We have seen what Moses asked to see but couldn't fully see, full of grace and truth, echoing, echoing those characteristics of God that he gave to Moses in that revelation. And this revelation of the glory of God in Jesus wasn't some discount, you know, no-name brand of the real thing that, you know, when you taste it, it's not, well, it's, you know, it's kind of like a cracker, but it kind of isn't really like a cracker. It tastes like styrofoam. No. When the disciples asked Jesus to show them the Father in John 14, he said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. He said, if you really know me, you know the Father as well. There is no incomplete or lesser when it comes to the glory of Christ compared to the Father. There is nothing more to see in the Father that we haven't already seen in Jesus. As Hebrews 1, 3 tells us, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. He's it. All of it. Moses could only get a glimpse of God's glory, but in Jesus, God has translated his glory into flesh and blood so that we might see it in all its fullness. Wow. And what is the glory we have seen in Jesus? Yes, there are many spectacular, brilliant, breathtaking, awe-inspiring events of power in Jesus' life. We think of his birth announcement by angels and where the glory of the Lord shone all around them. The brilliance and the power that was there. We, we think of the transfiguration up on the mountain where uh, Jesus showed his glory to Peter and James and John. And we think of his miracles of power, the, the power to heal and make whole, the power to command the wind and the waves, the power to drive out the spiritual forces of evil, the power even to raise the dead. Yes, in all these ways and more, we see the glory of God displayed in Jesus. And that's usually as far as we go when we think about the glory of God displayed in Jesus. But is that all? When John writes that we have seen his glory, is that all he means? Those acts of power and magnificence and greatness and shazam? I don't think so. Remember what we learned in Exodus 33 and 34. Remember how God has defined his own glory. Yes, in Jesus we see the power and wonder and glory of God. But in Jesus supremely we get to the core, the heart of the glory of God. Which he himself defined as being his goodness, his mercy, his grace. Because all those events of power, all those miracles weren't just Jesus showing off. It wasn't just about Jesus saying, hey, look what I can do. No, he healed the sick, he drove out demons, he rolled back the power of nature. Why? To reveal who he was. Yes, a God of power, but also a God of grace, of goodness. He heals, he drives out demons, he commands, not just for himself, but for others. For their good, to help, to serve, to bless them and us. He does these great acts of power out of his compassion. And just as God described the core of who he is as being merciful and gracious... Jesus, in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, describes himself, his heart, the only two words Jesus uses to describe his own heart, they are gentle and lowly. And I really hope you're tracking with me. I really hope you're starting to put the pieces together. Because when it comes to the, the greatest display of this heart of the glory of God in Jesus, what is it? It isn't found in angelic announcements or brilliant draw-dropping miracles of power. The greatest display of the glory of God in Jesus is found in his sacrificial death and resurrection for us. That, more than anything else, shows us the full glory of a God. The full weight of the heart and core of who God is in all his splendor and beauty and magnificence. That! More than anything else is the height and depth and length of the goodness of God, the mercy and grace of God, and it is glorious. That's why Jesus in John 13, right after the verse, right after Judas took the bread and went out into the night to follow through on his plan to betray Jesus. That's why we read right after that. 
John 13, 31, 32. When he went out, Judas, when Judas went out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. Now. Now the Son of Man is glorified. Now God is glorified in him. Why, why now? Why now? Why not three days from now? Resurrection power. Why in this dark moment right before his betrayal and agony and death? Because in that death we most clearly see God's heart. We see the core of the glory of God revealed, not just in all the awesome resurrection power to come, but all through those dark hours, we see the heart of God's glory revealed in his love and grace and mercy and goodness, that he would be willing to do all that, to suffer all that, to die for us. Once more, Dane Ortland summarizes, the Lord passed by Moses and revealed that his deepest glory is seen in his mercy and grace. Jesus came to do in flesh and blood what God had only done in wind and voice in the Old Testament. We are being told of God's deepest heart in Exodus 34, but we are shown that heart in the Galilean carpenter who testified that this was his heart throughout his life and then proved it when he went to a Roman cross, descending into the hell of God forsakenness in our place. So, have you figured out what this star reminds me of when it comes to the glory of God? Not just a bright, shining star or angelic announcement, those great shazams of power and glory. It reminds me of the greatest expression of the glory of God. The place where we most clearly see the heart of his glory, which is gracious and merciful, compassionate and loving. It reminds me of the crown of thorns that Jesus wore on that old rugged cross. There, more than anywhere else, is where we see the full weight of splendor, the full beauty and magnificence and glory of our King. My main statement for you today is this. The glory of our King is not seen best in stars and angels, but in the cross and a crown of thorns. That's a comparative statement. We see the glory of God, absolutely, in stars and angels and great shazams, absolutely. But where we see his glory most clearly displayed is in the cross. The gospel expressed in the death and resurrection of Jesus is the clearest picture of who God is, his greatest work. We see in Revelation, it's so great, we'll never be done singing about it. And so we come to our last point, our last question. What does all this have to do with me, with you, with us? Where do we fit in this story? We were ones in Adam and Eve who were created to be image bearers of God, to reflect his glory. But because of our sinful rebellion, we have lost that privilege. We were driven out and away from God's presence. We were under the sentence of death. But God in his glorious goodness did not leave us in that state. He sent Jesus to bridge the gap, to pay the price for us so that we could once again come near to God. We saw with Moses in Exodus 33 and 34 that God's glory, his full presence is something that without some mediation, it would be something we can never fully enjoy. We can never get close. That would destroy it. Jesus came as that mediator. Translate the glory and goodness of God and who he is to us. And to offer us the opportunity to draw near to him again. To enter into the most intimate of fellowship with him. To regain all that was lost because of our sin. All that was defaced and perverted in Adam is restored. Is brought to its fullness in Christ. If we turn from our sin. If we ask for his forgiveness. If we put our trust in him as our substitute. Our savior. Our Lord. In Christ in his gospel of Grace, we are invited to see and behold the full glory of God. As Paul writes for us, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. 
By God's grace, he enables our eyes to see, our hearts to understand and receive the gospel. Just as he created the world out of nothing in Genesis, so he creates new life in us out of nothing. We get to see the full display in the face of Christ of his glory. Not just a backside peek. He helps us to see that glory, yes, in his greatness, but also in his goodness, as he suffered and died in love for us. This glory is something that we see displayed in Jesus, but even more when it comes to us, this is a glory we will get to share in through Christ. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27. Through him we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the glory of God. Romans 5.2. And when Christ appears, you also will appear with him in glory. Colossians 3.4. We are partakers in the glory that is to be revealed. 1 Peter 5.1. This glory, which is so far above us, so much bigger and magnificent than we could ever imagine, is held out to us as something that we won't just get to see and watch from a distance. We will get to share in, participate in. We will spend all of eternity basking in the glory of God. And that's not just witnessing the miracles and the great divine shazam of the glory of God. No, we will spend all of eternity rejoicing and soaking in the full weight of who God is in all his splendor and beauty and magnificence revealed in his goodness and love and mercy and grace to us in Christ can't wait but in the meantime yes we do wait and sometimes we suffer but because of that hope of glory to come we do not lose heart as paul wrote in second corinthians 4 16 through 18 therefore we do not lose heart though outwardly we are wasting away yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day can i get an amen on that though outwardly we are wasting away we're feeling that yep for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. Not just a little bit of moment. An eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is seen. Uh, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Or as Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 10, 11, And the grace and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. He called you to this after you have suffered a little while. It doesn't feel like a little while. Yeah, and compared to eternity, it is. Will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. He has called us to his eternal glory in Christ. And no matter what happens between now and then, no matter how beat up and weak and wavering we become or feel at time, no matter how many bones are broken and scars we acquire and pains we have to endure, all that pain is temporary, but glory is forever. And one day soon, he will restore us and make us strong, firm, and steadfast. He will bring us safely home where we will bask in the glorious goodness of our God through all eternity. Who is this? This King of glory, the Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory and He will do it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You that You are a glorious God. And we pray that You would help us to remember to bask in the reality that that glory isn't just about power. It isn't just about might. It isn't just about miracles. That glory is about a goodness and love and mercy that you have so breathtakingly displayed in Christ. Lord, we thank you for this Son who was given for us. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. And to him and to you be all glory and honor. Amen. Let's stand and sing as we pray.
Stick around for Sunday school at 10.30. More information on that is in your bulletins if you need that. You can also ask somebody around you too. And now to Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made for us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. He 